welcome to the data science hangout thanks up for jumping on and, and co-hosting with me today so welcome back to all the familiar faces and to those joining for the first time it's really fun to see this like recurring group starting to form um, but for anyone new today these discussions cover a variety of, of different topics on data science leadership in the enterprise um, but really focus on questions that are most important to you all so again no agenda and everyone is welcome to join in live or, or put any questions that you have in the chat that said i'd like to just jump in here and introduce uh sep dodd satan executive director uh rwe and i am checking with you that is real world evidence <laughs> analytics that's, at concert ai yeah, yeah. um but sep's passionate about learning and exploring new concepts and ideas and and bringing them to life. I found that on your website somewhere. And I will say, Sep, I did learn a few random things about you making that, that intro, like DJing and foot golf. Um, but would you be able to kick things off by introducing yourself and sharing a bit about the work you do? Yeah, happy to. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I think uh, I've already been a part of several weeks of discussion and it's highly valuable. So I definitely encourage you guys to uh, share your perspectives. I think this is a, a great opportunity to just learn from everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, so my name is Sep Dotsatan. Um, my formal training education is in actually like molecular physiology. So I studied uh, immune cells and T cells um, and then made a, did a brief postdoc at Genentech studying B cells, the another immune cell. And then uh, that's when I said I was gonna leave academics uh, and join a startup company, uh, which was SIAPS, um, uh, where we worked with real world data uh, and real world evidence there. Um, so that was most of my tenure, seven and a half years there. A brief stint at, at Kite for a couple of years um, doing uh, IT for their R&D group. Um, and, then, um, and then recently joined uh, Concert AI back in the real world data space. Uh, about six months ago now. So that's kind of the brief uh, tour there. Um, with respect to what, what I do, I'm uh, at, at concert, I'm mainly kind of focused on um, achieving kind of scalability, reproducibility, um, uh, doing some training um, and trying to, at this point, really kind of focusing on architecture um, and trying to kind of uh, gather our teams um, and, uh, smooth some edges, so to say. Awesome, thank you, Sep. Um, so while we kind of wait for people's questions to come in, I'd, I'd love to kick sure. it off with, with one of our questions we, we often ask people, but what is something that you're really excited about in data science right now? Um, I think broadly speaking, I'm just excited about the level of, um, of adoption businesses are having around uh, around data in general and how it can impact their uh, their business. So um, I mean, I remember probably early 2010s, uh, you know, data science is this kind of term that's popping up. People are kind of, what is it? What is it? You know, it's probably still today we ask what that is, right? But um, uh, but a lot of businesses really weren't really sure what that meant and how it could benefit them. But I think you know now, like a decade later. We're seeing um, the a lot of companies IPOing that are in the data space. We're seeing increased uh, adoption of, of cloud computing. We're seeing a lot of uh, businesses really shift um, shift towards data, which really kind of I think solidifies that data is here to stay. All data science, data analytics, and data adjacent roles are here to stay, and that there's a lot of value to be pro to provided. So that's to me exciting. Um, and we're still kind of obviously shaking a lot of those things out to figure out what that means on a broad level. Um, um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, I think what's interesting probably on, on the forefront is also synthetic data. Um, I haven't played a whole lot in that space, but that's been pretty interesting to see how, um, you know, yeah, we generate a lot of data, um, you know, in general. Uh, but not a lot of that data is necessarily usable or if it is usable um, it may be sensitive in which case we have different strategies to allow you know technologies like ai and ml to kind of proceed in a um, in a more safe manner 
Um, so that's kind of exciting. Awesome. Is a company being like data first something that you like first look at when deciding where you wanted to work? Or I was just talking with someone yesterday and they were saying like um, when they were deciding which companies to to take a look at, that was a huge factor for them and, and maybe something for people to consider um, looking for new roles. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I, I, for me, I, I like a challenge. Um, so sometimes they want to be data first, um, and so that's where I'll, I'll I'll raise my hand. So cool, let's let's uh, let's figure out what that game plan is going to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, um, I think a business and especially the leadership to have uh, you know, to have the interest to want to go uh, into that direction and enable either enable the company to be that way uh, if they're not, or to just enable the company to continue to be that way, I think are both you know, highly important uh, uh, attributes, at least for me, and I'm sure a lot of the other people here on the call that are so interested in data, so. Definitely. I'll wait, I'm waiting for a few people to put some questions into the chat or, or feel free to jump in live, but. Yeah. Um, something else I thought might be helpful to co cover is, certain challenges that you face or something that you think is broken in, in data science today? Um, that's a great question. Um, there, there are a couple levels to that. So um, I think I'll start at, let's say the lowest level, which is the, the analyst data scientist. I think that since there isn't a single path to become a data scientist, people come from all walks of life. Um, you also then get this varied, um, varied training. And it's like a pro and a con because on one hand, um, usually they have domain expertise, usually they have you know, great skill set, but those with teams or how they've worked with teams in the past, it is. Is that me or Seth? Sorry, that was, I thought that was my internet for a second. <laughs> Are you, oh, was I, was I breaking up? You were breaking up for a little bit. I thought it was, it was on my end. It, is it okay for everyone else now? Let, let me know. Yeah. Okay. Yep. It's good, good for me. Good for Sorry, you might need to repeat just the. No, the that's okay. Clear, that. Clearly my internet doesn't like what I'm saying. So um, <laughs> it's trying to, trying to um, censor me. Um, <laughs> oh yeah so frank just got a new modem yeah I, I would, that's how i would react to um it's probably mine i don't know um so yeah so i think one of the the interesting aspects or, or i guess gaps might be how people come into data science and the varied you know directions that they come which would kind of um you know when we talk about training and like trying to get everybody on the same page it's a little bit more difficult than if you were to kind of kind of let's say have a standard path to become uh, a data scientist, so to say. So I think that's one of the challenges currently in the field. That's at the, that low level that I was kind of referring to. Um, at the higher level, I think we're in, an, in a bit of a transition period as businesses are starting to kind of realize the value that that data might provide them. Um, not all, not all, let's say leadership or a lot of businesses are data savvy. And I think again, that goes back to this training aspect where. You know, you need to translate your work for a business leader or someone who might not kind of understand it. Um, you know, that still exists and it's kind of will always shape how, let's say, data science groups get resources and funding. Um, and it will also shape, you know, how businesses will kind of uh, move forward and, and plot their course. So those are the two kind of, I guess, levels that, that I think are gaps in, in our current data realm. Yeah. On that point of kind of communicating it out to the business, I know Frank, you just had a question around business impact. Um, would you want to ask that one live? Sure. Um, so everyone has a different answer to this, but it, in terms of business impact, how do we show stakeholders or users um, the value it brings? Obviously, it's it's. Uh, making its way to the top and leaders are acknowledging it because to your point, Seth, 
this industry is growing, the jobs are here to stay. Uh, are there any examples that you have um, on how you, you demonstrate that? Obviously the more quantitative, the better, but oftentimes uh, that, is, that is a challenge. And so to, to, I guess, to clear that up, so are you in, are, are you referencing like, let's say a, enabling a new arm of the business or just to show that, show the business that, hey, look, we need more resources. This data is actually very valuable and how, this is how it'll. Yeah, I guess I would go, um, I'll, I'll skew it to, to my perspective, but um when I think about how stakeholders and leaders view the data science teams and folks, I think they think that every data scientist can do everything, all, all of the tools, like they can do everything, right? So they're like, you have five people, right? You should be able to do all of these projects and, and, and maybe even more. But the truth is there's only one person who has experience in forecasting, right? And it's super challenging to take on the 10 forecasting projects for the one person and get the other people up to speed. Um, and then at that point, they're like, well, I mean, if you can't do that, then you cost too much. And to, until you can like offset that with what is the value you're showing up with, whether it's like cadence of delivery, how fast you can work. And it's really hard, I find, to relate that all the way end, all the way to the end of the cycle where you're actually saving business cost or bringing in uh, increased revenues. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, that's a great question. I think that that generally applies to not only data science, but many other teams as well. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even engineering teams, you, sometimes you have one person that's like the front end developer, right? Um, I, you know, I, I think that what I've found success with, um, you know, and it's hit or miss sometimes, right? And it's not, not everything is a, a single solution or single path to a solution. Um, what I found success is just trying to be as close to the business as possible and understanding what their needs are. Um, sometimes you find that they just move too quickly to even know what their needs are. And so you have to kind of help guide them. And in doing that, um, you build this kind of partnership where you then have more value and understanding of how you can kind of guide, um, you know, or orient your team to provide that value. Um, and then they get closer to understanding it. Um, that would be kind of how I've found uh, a bit of success. Um, but yeah, it's not always, it's, it's super, it's not always straightforward. Is, is there anybody else that also has kind of uh, want to chime in and has experience in that? No? I was checking Fantastic. to see who unmuted themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, um, you know, like I'm trying to think of uh, think of examples. I mean, sometimes it's so so. My my experience has been very it's been quite varied. I've worked at, as like early employee at startup. And I've worked at like large pharma companies, like like you know Gilead kite, right? Um, and it always varies, right? At a, at a small startup, um, you know, it's always go go go. Priorities are shifting all the time. And so where I ended up trying to provide value was, yeah, occasionally you have to make those deliveries um, as, as requested, but um, when you're building the infrastructure in a way that makes that delivery, let's say reproducible or makes that infrastructure reproducible, um, and then, and they see the speed at which you can turn things around in the future, um, because the, inevitably we all probably have experienced this. Someone's gonna ask a question or want a delivery and then they want some variant of that delivery three months from now, right? And so you go build, you build that first iteration. Maybe it takes you, you know, a week longer to do it. But if you do it right, the next time they come around, it turns around in a day, they, they fall out of their chair, right? And I think that that's where all of a sudden you're, you're showing that, look, this is, this is the value of doing things in a manner that's, that's reproducible and scalable because we're saving costs where we are turning things around that impresses, you know, the customer. Um, and, uh, you know, and those are the things where you're like, okay, you know, regardless of who's doing it, the, the, the operation of the data program is, is, is efficient. Right. And so um, I take, I take pride in that. I love kind of efficiency in that regard. And so kind of scale and, and all those things are kind of an interest for me, but I don't know. And now I'm just, probably blabbering. I'd love to hear other people's take. 
how much uh, how how much time is spent on the prep work? I guess for for doing you know, what most people would think of, like you know, the data science analysis versus um versus doing. Uh, that makes sense. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, this is um, uh, I, I think it varies by industry. Um, in the industry that I'm in, I mean, we're dealing with with uh, people's health data. And it can be very, very messy. Um, but at the same time, it's very, very important. We're trying to recreate a patient's journey through uh, treatment and whatnot. And we want to make sure that we get it right. And so it ends up being quite slow, quite methodical. There's a lot of people that are involved to make sure that um, we're making clinically appropriate assumptions um, to then finally get to you know, how we get to our data set, right? And so it's probably a lot longer in the real world data space than, than perhaps others, but I don't have a whole lot of experience in, in other, uh, other types of data sets. Um, I think, you know, you probably have the, the adage that's like 80% of a data scientist's time is spent cleaning, cleaning data and organizing data uh, might be appropriate. I, I don't know. I've never really kind of thought about it, to be honest. I just kind of like get it done and, and try to do it in a manner that I don't have to do it like repetitively try to build on knowledge. And is that like, something that you have to um, communicate with other folks in the business about, or do they usually understand? You know that there's a lot that goes into, you know, the pre-cooking. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes to, uh, I guess, to go back to Rachel's question about what gets me excited, right? So what gets me excited is that great, all these businesses are very interested in, in data, we're here to stay, right? But there's a, a flip side to that is that data literacy uh, also is required. Um, and so um, there are various levels. So some people are, are happy to understand the, the nuance and the nitty gritty of why it takes so long to kind of stitch these things together. And then there are others that are saying, look, we need to deliver to the customer. This is what we want. Um, and, I, and I get that it takes time, but hurry up, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I always try to kind of simplify and, and you know, really kind of point out, uh, give status updates. I mean, transparency for me is, is really important. So if you're transparent with your stakeholders and you, you know, they recognize what, you know, what, what the blockages are, and I think everybody that you're gonna get engaged with is gonna wanna know so that they might be able to help out. I think that again, helps with establishing that relationship and, and having them get a little bit closer to the data and understand some of the, um, you know, the hurdles that you might face. Um, but, uh, but yeah, sometimes, um, you know, patience is, is perhaps thin and they don't quite, quite get it. Um, and, but that comes with this other side. If you're gonna be more data company, we're going to have to have more data literacy and what, what are our better methods of perhaps working with data and uh, how, it can, how it can enhance us rather than, let's say, throw people at a problem, you know, do it intelligently from an engineering standpoint so that you can scale your operations. So you can throw more people at it, but when you're throwing people at it, you're providing more company value rather than trying to, uh, you know, wade through the mud with increasingly large data sets or increasingly complex data sets. Hey, can I jump in here? Sep, you mentioned, yeah. uh, I think you used two words, partnership and relationship somewhere as you were describing that. And I, um, I have found every single time I've had a new team that partnership and relationship with my stakeholders and the business users, users is immense, right? Once they, they trust you and they say, Oh, you, you're actually on my team. Like we're working towards the same goal and they get it. And one of the tried and true ways I've done that is if it's transportation, I read a transportation textbook and we're not in the office anymore, but like once my partners see that I have a transportation textbook on my desk, they're like, Oh, you really are like on this team trying to solve this problem, right? You're not just the data person or data team over there. That's huge. With that said, I've had success there, but Scaling relationships and partnerships is really hard because they both take time, right? And we, we, we want to be data teams and we want things, we want to do things efficiently and scale it across hundreds of thousands of decisions. Um, 
I don't know, does anyone have any thoughts on how to balance scale and efficiency with relationships and partnerships? Yeah, I'd love to hear from others too. That's a great point. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Sergio. Hi, I'm, I'm, uh, hi, I'm Sergio, and, and I'm actually connected from Bolivia, and it's so in interesting to be here and listening to all the all the experiences you're talking about. And actually, well, I started a company, a well, data science company here in Bolivia uh, about maybe six months ago or something like that. Well, previously, we, me and my partner, we have been working on different different consulting projects related to data science and well managing data. But it's so interesting right now that, well, I wanna share you what my experience is at this point. We, well, we believe we're doing really well because we're starting to get involved in interesting projects with different, uh, with different uh, sectors, for example, mining sector, financial sector, and, and, and well, what we, ha we have noticed and well, our approach is to, or our strategy is to, to have a first meeting, for example, with, with these different companies. And we are not offering uh, exactly like solutions or services or products. Like our first approach is to try to make them understand what all this idea is about. And well, something that is super important, I believe that, that they have to understand is that, well, data science is kind of a, a structure that is, is, is a, is a uh, well it has three main parts that is basically the, the the well the programming part the it part then the statistical and anal analytical part and then the well one of the most important is the the the, 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 the know-how and how how everything works and actually what frank was talking about like talking about transportation for example you have to being as being a a, a, a a partner or working for them, you have to start understanding what the work is about and understand being part of the company. So uh, I think that's super important. Like when you when you try to to have a, a well a relation with any company or any any industry, first you al also have to understand uh, what it is about and how how it works, how everything everything works, and work really really close to them to to be able to to develop these solutions and. And well, that's the, 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 the experience we, we are living right now. Like, it seems like the, like <clears throat> when you talked about infrastructure, like I think sometimes you think servers, but you were talking about like how you actually set up those projects so that you can make things reproducible. But it seems like those relationships are almost a part of the infrastructure as well. Um, and it's curious, just talking a bit more about how how you do make that infrastructure reproducible. So, yeah, great question. Um, so, yes, uh, I mean reproducibility and scalability. All, I mean, it it relies on the success of of training, making sure everybody's doing things, and and the processes are all the same. And it also is related to this partnership and relationship. So, um, I think it's interesting for myself that I spent a couple of years in IT uh, at Kite Pharma, which is a common thing that, you know, a lot of people on the other side, on the analytics side, need to deal with at larger companies. And so it was really nice to kind of get the perspective from the IT side and, and now come to concert and say, okay, I get how it works. Like I can, you know, um, so yeah. So part of, part of uh, re reproducibility for me is, you know, uh, everything I mean it's like it really involves everything so you know making sure everyone's kind of using um, yeah, you know let's say version control the same way uh, that naming conventions are the same um, we built a uh, basically a, a, a package uh, an R package so that when people create new because uh, we use our studio so we uh, create a new package so that when you create a new our studio project, that project will always be the same. So it creates the same folders, um, the same setup. So when I'm talking infrastructure to make it reproducible, everything from how you use code, how you name your code, how you name your variables, how your projects are set up, how your files are named, all of that stuff, it, they're, they're really, really annoying little, little things, but they bubble up to be so much more because 
when you create a, a project, for example, an analytical project, um, everybody that it becomes a transposable unit. That means I can take my project, I go on vacation for a year, someone emergency request, someone else can pick it up and know exactly where the data is, know exactly where the scripts are, you know, et cetera. And they, they should be able to pick it up with a lot less, uh, you know, overhead for having to figure out, oh, well, how did SEP organize this stuff? Like, I don't know, right? That that takes sometimes days. Um, so that's, that's one, uh, I think a big part of it actually, to be honest, is a lot setting up a lot of that real basic stuff. And then it also makes it much smoother so that every time you set up a project, you don't have to like think about think about those things. You just kind of go, um, this is where you write your stuff and, and whatever. Um, and then we happen to use R Connect um, as well. I know that there are other solutions, but that allows us a, a feedback loop. I think one of the aspects that, um, you know, that we end up talking a lot about in these, these weeks are like communication um, and how you communicate with business stakeholders. And so, you know, if we're going to set up that, you know, our studio project, we want to then be able to publish it, whatever that output is, whether it's an API, whether it's a product, a report, whatever, an application, we want to be able to publish it and publish it in a central location so people aren't trying to search for it everywhere. Um, and then we have a URL, we could share that URL and we get this feedback loop. It's not sitting in somebody's email and part of a chain. You have to then go through your email. And so we've kind of streamlined it. Um, and that allows us to kind of, you know, you could basically hit a conveyor belt. If there's iterations, changes, we can kind of do that. And then it's modular so other people can kind of pick it up. So that's the kind of, I guess, reproducibility and scalability that I'm referring to. Thank you. And I, I see Trevor has a question which kind of touches upon this as well around quality of data. Trevor, would you want to introduce yourself and, and ask that question? Hi, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> nice meeting you all. Very good sessions every week. <laughs> yeah. So my name is Trevor Thompson, actually from Jamaica. Um, work for a global gaming company. Um, I'm very interested in the infrastructure. When we talk about data, we speak about models, we speak about data science, but um, the emphasis on talking about the quality of data that we use garbage in, garbage out, right? And the process of collecting, cleaning, and storing. I know it's maybe be, it may be it is a data engineering process, but of course it's very important when you talk about data science. Even since week, I was involved in a process with an application that collects the coordinates um, of some locations. And we found out recently that the the collection process is not precise enough. So we're ending up in a situation where, where we have this consultant who wants a great degree of precision in terms of identifying a location, but the radius um, of the collection points is like 83 meters. So that's definitely not as precise as, as I would want it to be. So some of these things you don't even realize until you're really digging deep. Right, so this has always been on my mind when we talk about the quality of data that we use all throughout the, the data science process. You know, so it's, it's just about thinking about that. Um, you know, so that's what's on my mind here. Mm. Yeah, um, thanks for chiming in, Trevor. Uh, by the way, I love your accent. Jamaican accent's one of my favorites. <laughs> um, uh, so feel free to chime in further. Um, uh, I, if anybody else has, has something to say about it, I know from, uh, from an, th there's many ways, architecture and infrastructure can refer to a variety of things. Um, and there's many ways to kind of solve for whatever your business purposes are. Um, I mean, generally you have to partner pretty closely with your data engineering team. It kind of depends. Sometimes data engineers themselves have a little bit of an analytical bent to them. So they're always kind of constantly checking um, other times there's a dedicated QC team that's constantly evaluating and, and kind of sampling um, as data moves from, from place to place, just to make sure that you are collecting the right information and that uh, all the transformations are, are going accordingly. 
Um, other times, and again, depends on the size of the company and, and how roles are broken up, you know, the data science team should have someone that is actually kind of evaluating or at least generating some sort of uh, report out of wherever the staging areas of your existing data is, uh, is sitting um, to kind of hopefully prevent that where you do all this work and eventually you get it and you're like, oh boy, this is not what we wanted at all. Um, uh, so many ways to kind of solve that. I, I don't know what your particular setup is, but that's those are a couple ways in which um, you know we've solved that in the past, which is just to kind of uh, somehow what for, through whatever team get our hands on things a little bit early and sample um, just to make sure things are kind of uh, as we expect them to be. Yeah. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Cool. Try to wait the like <laughs> seven seconds for people to chime in there. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone else has uh, thoughts about that, I think Mike Thomas, you chimed in a little bit about that and more so about, about the time spent on design. Do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, Sep spoke pretty well to it. I just find that communicating up front and I think design kind of does this intrinsically um, is when you spend a lot of time on designing kind of what the output solution is going to be. It requires you to bring all the stakeholders to the table up front. Um, you know, the owners of the data, the owners of the, the platform, the people who are going to be using your solution, you know, on the ground a day in and day out, the technical folks in your analytics team, and then also the IT team that, that might be enabling uh, the solution to even work, security, infrastructure, stuff like that. Um, I think when you focus, when at least you attack the project with a design mindset up front and really focus on nailing down um, you know, what the end-to-end -end process is going to look like, um, I think it pays off quite a bit in the end in ensuring that you know, whatever you put together uh, is, is well architected, um, you know, maybe you're ensuring that there's a data dictionary behind all the data that's that's being used, um, you know, things like that, and that the output is is what everybody's expecting it to be. I find myself nowadays probably drawing as many, spending as much time drawing architecture diagrams as I am writing our code, which, which um, you know, is fun if you're into that, but I think it's an, an important um step to take in, in any project. And I think it's a good team mindset to have as well. I like uh, Daniel's question from earlier that kind of relates to this as well, Mike, but like balancing that form, like that making the process and making it more formal versus getting the results quickly for someone. Um, Daniel, would you wanna kind of chime in and give your background and how you've experienced that? Sure, absolutely. Um, so my, my name is Daniel. I'm a lead data scientist with Nestle. Uh, and, and it's touching a little bit on what, what Seth, you were speaking to before in that kind of like, if time was not a requirement, then I think uh, I personally know a lot of people in, in our positions would kind of want things to be as formal and as repeatable as possible so that, to your point, like somebody else can come in if I'm away, or I can easily understand and read somebody else's code. But the drawback is that it takes time to do. Uh, and so one of the things that, that I struggle with personally on, on the team is I probably lean much more towards the formal side and not everybody does. And I have struggled figuring out how much to kind of push those others to kind of fit my system, so to speak. At the same time, knowing that uh, they're, they're highly competent data scientists in, in their own right, they just uh, structure things a little bit differently than I do. And if I kind of not, not force them, but kind of, uh, uh, try to influence them to fit into one standard way of doing things that it slows them down and the the end result of whatever it is that they're building or analyzing uh it is isn't as available as soon as possible so so it's just that constant struggle 
at Nestle now, but as well as other places where I've been, like how how much do you try to make things repeatable and formal versus um, kind of like every person is their own system? Yeah, um, that's that's a that's a great question, and it's a it is a common situation uh, for better or for worse. Um, I think again, it depends on on the culture of the team and and what the what the business is really kind of after. I think, um, and it depends on I don't know what relationships are like. I I I like to try and lead by example. Um, so at the very least, if I'm finding that it's difficult to kind of you know, hey, like, look, this is a, this is a large team or, or the team's really, everyone's kind of just doing their thing and, and in their own, uh, in their own lanes. At the very least, I try to simplify it for myself um, and try to make my work uh, more reproducible. And in many cases, what ends up happening is whether there's a, you know, code review or whether there is, uh, you know, future fire drills or whatever, um, that will, that process will always win out. Right. And when someone else sees it, they're like, oh, maybe that that's cool. Maybe I want to try that. How did you do that? Right. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes it's not so easy just to kind of, you know, go dictate to people and say, look, like this is how you should do it um, uh, until they kind of come to the realization themselves. Um, and so that was, you know, that's one one method that might work where it's just at the very least you could do it for yourself. It does take time. Um, but even small wins are important, right? So I've been in situations where, I mean, especially in a startup where it's like, okay, we need something in two weeks that we don't have anything, like nothing exists right now, but we need to fill it for two weeks, right? So it just ends up being, okay, just dive onto the keyboard. But, but even in those cases, wherever I can uh, have kind of an engineering mindset and modularize what I can, uh, I know that those pieces can be used either on other projects or this project becomes much easier with future revisions. Um, and um, and that, I think that goes back to what, I'm, what I was saying is that everybody comes from so many different angles um, into data science. Sometimes that engineering piece uh, isn't there. And so, you know, you know showing people that, that you could do it a particular way might be helpful. I might have a couple of things to add there as well, if it's okay. Really yeah, quick. of course. I think probably, I think this is what Seth was speaking to, but maybe this is a more high level view um, of the answer to your question. I think it's a belief that collaboration in the end will make your team more successful and make uh, your projects more successful and more efficient, right? You're not going to get Collaboration, uh, collaboration is not going to go as well if everybody's in their lane and they have different standards and, and you, you don't have necessarily code review because somebody's writing their, their code in one style and, and other people are writing their code in, in a totally different style. So I think the way maybe to go about fostering that or, or preaching it would be um, to get people to buy into the idea that collaboration is going to make your, your team more efficient, effective, uh, get you in the end, at the end of the day, once you have uh, things set up, um, you know, get you those results quicker. And I think Seth made a great point about small wins. I think small wins in this case, in terms of, you know, just even styling functions or documentation around your code and things like that um, can go a, a long way towards turning on the light bulb in, in people's mind about how some standards around how folks are writing their code can, can be effective. Yeah. So just to add a bit there. So one of the selling points for us when we talk about data science and about using tools like R is about efficiency, right? The ability to produce re re um, reproducible code or results and efficiency. So even though we may think documentation and structure is boring, and it is, <laughs> we know if it's not in place, what the results are, right? So essentially something that would take you two minutes may take you an hour, right? And in terms of even communication, communication with members on your team or even outside, when there is no commonality, you're talking about in Jamaica, we call it Chinese telephone, where you're trying to get to someone, you can't get to them because the language is different. 
So, you know, what is so interesting about this conversation now is that we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about communication, and none of this is really about data analysis itself, but how important all the, 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 the tenets or all the connecting points around the data analysis itself is extremely important. That's what I get from that. Definitely. Yeah. Trevor, I want to save that snippet that you, <laughs> you just said there, because I, I think that is so, so important. And, and also like the thinking about the communication back to the team about that as well. And like, how do you communicate that back to the business if, oh, they got this one report in one day because you had already set it, that process up? How do you help them understand every report doesn't just come in in one day like that yeah uh yeah uh, i mean it's it's uh it's again it's like showing the art of the possible um yeah and i think when when they realize you know we do you do things uh, in a smart way then you can gain speed um they're more than happy to then support that right so um if if, uh, if a new request comes that's outside of the scope of the original request, they they then have an understanding of what it took to make that original one, and then they'll want it again because it's again it's like building knowledge and it's building scale, right? Not every, you're not going to get everything in one one go, but if you do things you know uh, majority the right way the first time, uh, over time you're going to have a bolus of of knowledge that you're you're enabling the, the remainder of the, the business, um, whether that's other groups, whether that's marketing, whatever, to be able to do what they do. And I think that that's where the, va the value uh, comes out, right? It's not just, um, you know, sitting at a keyboard and, and you know, writing out the script and, and getting a result. You could do that and that works, um, but you're trying to think a bit more long-term um, so yeah, that's at least how we've, we've approached it. Are there a few um, small organizational or, or collaboration activities that are sort of your go-tos, uh, you know, when leaning a team or uh, you know, a group of people into a more, more formal way of doing things? Um, I can't share that information. That's proprietary, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> oh, you're clear. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've got a secret. No, um, no, I think, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I think there's a, you know, one of the questions that I think that was discussed perhaps in the past was like people that are interested into getting into leadership, right? Um, there's naturally going to be a transition point where your hands aren't on the keyboard as often, um, you know, where you're not, you're not doing the analysis per se, but now you have to manage a team uh, and, and, and grow that team. And, and, come, and with that come different responsibilities. And so some of those responsibilities are just evangelizing your team and being able to communicate and work with other business partners. And so I think, you know, um, I've been now in, I think two situations where I have either started a team from scratch or the team is basically pretty new. And I think the most important thing is obviously you get your bearings first, but um, then, basically going on a, uh, on a tour, right? Speaking to all the business partners, uh, di different stakeholders around the company and trying to understand what it is they do, how they engage with data, how they envision working with uh, that team um, and, and just maintaining those relationships, like constantly having, having conversations and not being afraid to like help out when you can, right? Sometimes some of these groups might be uh, resource strapped um, and so jumping in and, and trying to solve little problems here and there may be helpful. And I think that builds the rapport. It kind of accelerates a little bit about this partnership building and, um, you know, really allows, uh, allows you as a group to have a better understanding of the business so that you can align uh, your, your priorities in, in accordance with that and, and the goals of the business, um, but also allows them to understand how you operate um, and what benefit you can bring to the table. Um, and then when those things kind of align, then you start to be a little bit more uh, closely integrated. Does that answer the question? And the, the one follow-up I have is on that tour, is there a, like a balance between fielding 
requests or projects and then like seeking out areas where you, know, you want to bring something to the table? Yes. And I think this depends again on, on how the business is led. Um, so if the business has very clear goals uh, and guidance, um, then your group should always really kind of be aligned with that. Other business units may, may or may not have, uh, you know, alignment in that regard. And so you can't just, you, I mean, some people are nice and they just want to field whatever request. Okay, fine. You could do that. You're still going to, you know, get some wins, but it'll be also a bit more distracting towards you achieving what you need to do as a team to become most efficient because now you have perhaps extraneous projects. Um, whereas if the business is, uh, you know, some, some businesses might not be so clear on their, on their objectives and goals. Maybe it's new, maybe it's fluid. Um, and so that requires partnership with those other business units. Are we really, you know, doing the best, biggest bang for our buck and, and doing these projects? And so, yeah, there is a balancing act. You don't want to field all requests. It doesn't hurt to have an understanding of all the requests so that you have uh, an idea and then can maybe say, hey, you know what, like there's a piece of this that we might be able to work on or a piece of this, or maybe we can just tackle this for you. Um, uh, and then, and don't be afraid to kind of also ask, right? Ask how other people might be able to help. Um, sometimes that's just, you know, being involved in maybe, you know, weekly or, or bi-weekly or bi-monthly or whatever presentations that they have so that you're aware of their work. And I think that that shows that you have an invested interest in, uh, in them, their success um, and hopefully they reciprocate as well. And I think that then brings the whole business together and it also uh, really helps the, the data science and data analytics group as well. Awesome. I'm, I'm trying to like group together some of the questions so that we don't keep like jumping back back and forth, but I think on this topic, um, I saw Tracy, you commented on um, a helpful resource for cultivating collaboration in data science. Would you want to maybe introduce yourself and provide any additional context on that? Sure. Hi, um, I, my name is Tracy Teal, and I'm the relatively new open source program manager at our studio. Um, and so I'm focused on the open source tools that uh, our studio is building, like the Tidyverse and the, the Elmoverse and Shiny. What's Tidyverse? Um, so Tidyverse I'm is- I'm kidding, oh. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I, you know, there's all kinds of different stakeholders. <laughs> I'm first on this call. I was on a Tidy Models meeting, so I'm sorry it was a little late to this one. No, um, but yeah, I'm just, you know, wanted to get a chance to hear, you know, how people are are using tools and what challenges they're facing. And I think um, one of the themes I've seen throughout my career, I've worked in nonprofit and academic spaces as well, is where the challenges are more social than tools, um, <laughs> which has been you know, a lot of this conversation. And so I was part of a, a collaboration where we put together this sort of, there's this framework in um, PLOS, uh, of 10 simple rules there, none of which are actually simple, but that's the title of the series. Um, so we put together kind of this, this set of things to think about in these collaborations, because um, like what you were saying, Trevor, of the situation of like getting into a project and expectations aren't the same and how do you talk to each other? There's always themes that come up in any project and it feels like, like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one that's doing this wrong but it actually is like one of the biggest challenges. So I've loved this conversation um, that might have some guidelines there. I think one of the other things we focused on in that um, and paper and we think about in our work and in open source as a whole is really about um, the inclusivity of the environment and for really a successful collaboration. So setting up the, that kind of framework in advance, really allowing everybody to participate um, especially when you have these challenges of language that's not shared, like your data scientist, maybe use words that your domain researchers or your domain experts don't. So a lot to learn um, on each side of the fence. Definitely. Thank you, Tracy. And Tracy, I see you shared that link a little bit above in the chat if anyone wants to, to check that out. Um, but I 
see earlier, Toyan, you had a question, which actually Tracy might be able to help provide some context on as well, but um, around tips for uh, transitioning from academia to industry. Toyan, you wanna introduce yourself and expand on that? Certainly. Um, hello, my name is Toyan Ola. I am a behavioral health data analytics program coordinator um, for a state behavioral health agency. Um, and right now I am focused on trying to get a data workflow together for um, what is essentially a police criminal justice um, and behavioral health program um, to divert individuals from the criminal justice system when they're experiencing behavioral health emergencies. Um, and we've learned that really a big component of that will be getting data, 911 call data from public safety answering points. Um, so to Frank's point, I've spent a lot of time learning about the emergency communications world um, so that I do have some sort of shared language with them since I was completely naive to that world beforehand. Um, but I guess, you know, my question is tips for transitioning industries when you're new to an industry, don't understand the language, and even on a more technical side, um, you know, there are some analyses that are more common in certain industries than others. Um, so any feedback along those lines would be helpful. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I think for data scientists, so true, because the data science skills are applicable in so many different contexts, but then you have to get up to speed on that context. Um, I guess maybe I'll speak from my personal experience. I mean, one is just like that confidence and that you can learn it. <laughs> um, like just, you know, there's always going to be that, that learning. Um, and it sounds like you already have that and like encouraging that in others, just that sense that like, no, you're not going to know everything, but what I have confidence in is, is my ability to learn this. Um, in terms of yeah, particular tips um, is I one situation I've seen because I also worked in high performance computing um, is maybe that the the computational person comes in sort of feeling like they have the answers and not uh, necessarily listening or asking the right questions. Um, so coming into it, you know. You, you sound like you're already doing all of this. So, you know, just like um, with that perspective of listening, but also um, thinking of the right questions to ask. So spending some time, not only like listening, but then formulating questions uh, for people to answer. And sometimes um, people are better about answering them like in a conversation. And some people like to have time with the questions and write them. So sometimes I'll provide um, different mechanisms for people to give me information or feedback because people work in in different ways. Um, so I found that um, that to be helpful. Um, I'm in this similar situation now. I'm six weeks into our studio, I think. So uh, I, I'm trying to learn and ask questions, and um, and then I think yeah, that other strength that it sounds like you're already bringing to the table is that synthesis. So writing down for yourself. Um, to synthesize the information or write it down and share it back and say, you know, is this, is this right? I don't know if those are actually helpful. <laughs> it is. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tracy. Seb, do you have anything else to add to that too? Um, I'm a, I, I mean, I have a lot of interests. So I've, I've like between a lot of different kind of areas. I think for me, um, and I've, I've also hired people that are from outside of, uh, outside of healthcare and outside of pharma. Um, I, I exactly what, what Tracy was saying. I think I think ha being, being humble, um, but also tenacious, um, where, you know, if it's an area that you want to kind of go explore and apply, you, you know, again, your data science skills are, are kind of applicable to anything. It's that domain knowledge that generally people need to show in a, in a particular interview. Um, and so, yeah, if you're tenacious enough to be like, yeah, I could do it. And you have that confidence to do it, but also recognize that you don't know everything and there may be nuances and be uh, receptive to listening and getting that feedback. I think those are attributes that are fantastic, um, to have, because I love taking people that are outside of that area, just to bring a new perspective into it, but they have to also have the right personality 
to be able to do so in a manner that's not like, oh, like dis, dis, you know, dismiss or disregard, you know, whatever anybody else is saying because they know it all. Um, to that end, like even doing, you know, small projects uh, with data in that given space that you're interested in also goes a long way to show that, oh yeah, this person's actually pretty serious about uh, you know, pursuing this, um, you know, they did this in-depth analysis in whatever sports analytics or something like that. Um, and so pairing those two together, I think, I think you should be totally fine whichever way you want to go. Thank you. I appreciate it. If any, if no one else has anything to add there, I see Frank, you asked a, a question kind of a follow-up question from a point made earlier um, around data science being, is it different than data science infrastructure? Uh, Frank, would you want to expand a bit on that? Yeah. Um, okay. So as, as this whole conversation has been going on, I've been thinking about, um, and it started when Trevor had mentioned the garbage in, garbage out and talking about his experience there, but uh, in the supply chain world, I go and visit distribution centers and right being in retail. So I work for Target. So being in retail, we have a ton of distribution centers around the country. And I, I've been in supply chain for quite a few years now. And when you go into a distribution center, as you're touring a warehouse and walking around, if you are paid hourly to keep it organized and pick up the trash, that's what you do. If you are a manager walking the warehouse and you see a piece of trash on the floor, you pick it up. If you are the CEO of the company and you see a piece of trash on the floor, you pick it up. Everybody that walks through there is responsible for making sure it's organized and clean because it's safe. And the truth is, if our distribution centers don't operate, we don't have product on the shelves, we don't make money, and we don't profit, right? That's bad for everyone. So everyone feels a responsibility to do that, no matter what your level. I think about the data industry and data-driven companies. And um, Sep, you had talked about a data engineering group versus a data science group. And once people start to have this perspective where they say, hey, this is my job, this is what I do. And they, they allow garbage data to flow through their pipelines because they were responsible for the pipeline, not what's flowing through it. I feel like that's a really bad environment and mindset. I see that responsibility for having the right infrastructure, infrastructure being like the data, because that's the information. Everyone that touches it somewhere along the line should to feel that sense of commitment to, to make it better. Um, and I, I guess then my head, would, that's kind of where I left off and thought like, man, the data science part, you can't just be responsible for data munging and building algorithms. Um, and then on the, the other side, like the infrastructure teams, the teams that are building tools can't just be responsible for the tools and say like, hey, tool, go out into the world, like good luck out there. Um, it's gotta be a, a team effort. And I know that as your company gets bigger, like I work at Target, like it gets harder and harder and harder to instill responsibility for that because there's a trade-off, right? I, we only have every individual and team only has so much time and so much bandwidth and resources, but it is absolutely critical if you think you are going to become a data-driven company. Tangent over. <laughs> Does anyone have thoughts? Stand, standing ovation, Frank. Standing <laughs> ovation. Um, I, I that resonates with me hundred um, percent. I, I totally agree. Like, if you're gonna do work, do quality work. Um, and, and just and but uh, but I, I don't know. At least for me, the the reality is that uh, many of the people that I've engaged with uh, are on both sides of the coin. Some people are like hey, it's just a job. I'm gonna do what I'm do what I'm told. And, the, it, and it's sometimes, it's in, especially with data, it's like, it takes that little bit extra to be like, am I, just let me just double check. Am I really getting what I'm supposed to be getting? And then, and if you don't do that, then it's again, it's on the next target employee or whatever to go pick up that trash, right? Um, I, so I, I don't have a particular solution. I know in our industry, you know, patients' lives effectively are on the other end of it. Um, and right, so that's, right. that's, a, that's a big motivation for many people. That's why they do what they do. It's not easy. Um, but yeah, it's also not, it's a, you know, a lot of it also is domain knowledge. Like if you're not a clinician and you don't know what hematocrit is, right? Like, how do I even know what I'm looking at? Right. So right. that, that, that's the problem we end up having is we have to have dedicated like informaticists that are also looking at the data 
and you can't rely on a data engineer that might not even know what the medical medical information is right yeah. but uh, but i totally agree i, I wish people yeah. kind of did that i think uh hugh has a has raised his hand hey uh so no i was just gonna offer a quick um aside uh, there was a really neat uh, presentation I think Colin Gillespie gave last week on practical advice for ARM production that talked a little bit about uh, infrastructure versus the data science piece. And, you know, it's all of our responsibility, you know, to make sure things work. But at some point, I really like what he said. At some point, uh, role specialization is, is crucial because you wouldn't ask IT to build your model for you. You, know, you wouldn't ask them to, you know, do your exploratory data analysis, all that stuff, but you also wouldn't ask the data scientist to make sure you have a update schedule or that, you know, you're all using the same version of R, that kind of thing. So it's, it's neat. You talk about how do you find that balance and depending on the maturity of your program and the, you know, the amount of support you have, you have to find it uh, at your level. So, yeah. Great point. Thanks here. I just put that link in the, the chat as well. I just found the recording there. Um, I know we're uh, just at the top of the hour here. So if anyone has to jump, no worries. You have to run to another meeting. I do see there's one other question left that we didn't get to yet. Um, so I'd love to chat more about that. If Sergio is still on, would you want to yeah. introduce yourself? Or you already introduced yourself, but ask that question live. Yeah, sure. No, it's something I'm living right now because well, the companies I'm working with, right, they, they they don't have anything. They're starting from scratch, and it's super interesting. It's it's basically a, a progressive transition into the data science culture. But eventually, I know, and our objective is is to be able to implement like our Studio Connect a tool, something like that. But maybe hearing about some experiences, uh, maybe you can share about small companies that just started with 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 these data science tools and when is a good point to start thinking about or start implementing uh, other tools that is going to be part of, of developing developing uh, teams, data science teams, for example. Um, I, I, and anybody else, I mean, I have, a, I have a very specific experience with this. I don't know if anybody else uh, would like to jump in, um, but uh, so I have a, a, a a belief that like, you know, you have to have your data kind of in order before you get your data scientists and analysts. Um, a lot of times it ends up being reversed and then you have a data scientist who may have like pretty reasonable experience with like engineering and, and getting the data in shape. But, um, uh, uh, but you know, that's not necessarily their area of expertise. And so um, eventually, as long as that's understood that that's going to be technical debt and it can be addressed later, okay, then that maybe it's fine. But generally, you're going to want to get your data in order and have a, a very clear strategy of, of how you're ingesting that data, how it's going through its various stages until it gets to its, you know, resting state to, to have then products or whatever built, be built on top of it. So I would say that would be, that should probably come first. Um, and in many cases, uh, it would be, if possible, it would be great that it's done with someone that has analytics, data science expertise as well, because sometimes the data engineer doesn't have that other side of the, uh, of the coin. Um, and so the two together would be the greatest kind of start where you have a data engineer and you have a data scientist analyst. Um, and then however they prefer to choose, I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, R biased, but I mean, you, could, you could also do this in Python. And then you kind of build your uh, tool set and architecture around that, right? So once you have your pipeline, you can then say, okay, well, how are we gonna do the analysis? How are we gonna make this scalable? How do we deliver our products? And you now have kind of at least some kind of foundation for a small team, literally two people. Um, very talented people, but two people at least. Um, so uh, that would be, that's how I would, if I was to do it, uh, over, I would do it that way. Um, I've done it probably in two different iterations of that too, but. Thanks, Seb. Does anyone yeah. else have anything to add to that? Mike, I feel like your analogies in the chat also apply to this <laughs> piece as well.
Yeah, thanks. I, I was actually thinking a bit, uh, jumping to a different analogy about cooking, right? You know, everyone can cook at home with the equipment they have to hand. You don't need the very best. But, you know, if you want Michelin star cooking, then you've got to have the right people with the right tools, the right skills to bring it all together. Um, and I, I think it's easy, uh, just what Seth was saying, it, it, it's not easy, but it's easier when there's a very small group because you can have that one-to-one -one dialogue that says, okay, I know what you're doing, you know what I'm doing, we know the tools that we have, let's come together and get this done. When you go to a really big organization, and this comes back to something that, that Frank was saying, there's a tendency for people to grab the tools they know, hack it, whatever they need to do to get today's work done and get it out the door. And the problem there is that in doing that process, they leave a damn mess everywhere. <laughs> you know, they leave the pots and pans lying about and everything's, you know, messy and, and they don't clean up afterwards. And so, it, you know, having, as the organization grows, having people that know what they're doing you know, know exactly what's expected to get the what they need to do, do the, what they need to do, and then leave the place in a tidy framework because they know that they're going to have to do it again, you know, in a minute or in an hour or tomorrow. Um, and so that uh, there's that kind of chefy thing of mise en place. You chop up, you get all the pieces nice and tidy so that when the orders start coming in thick and fast, you know you can get your job done. And, and my, you know, I work in a big organization and, um, you know, there's an awful lot of people who are doing their own way, you know, and I kind of like the tidy verse thing of it's opinionated, but it's opinionated for a reason because you can then, you know, reproduce that pipeline again and again and again using the same kind of tools. You know, I have lots of colleagues that learned R 10 years ago and they, they're all base R and they're like, yeah, but I can do that in base R. It's like, I, that's great. I'm really happy for you that you can do that in base R. This isn't a competition. This isn't code golf. You know, I, I, I'd like us to be able to do it in a way that I can pass my stuff to you. You can pass your stuff to me. And, you know, we know what we're going to get. And we can then be part of that you know, chain of getting stuff out the door. But getting it out the door looking good, smart, fulfilling the brief. You know, what everyone wants to see on their plate. I'm sorry, I'm all about analogies. <laughs> I love Great that. Analogies. Like. <laughs> yeah. You're inspiring me to go get better organized. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I see any other questions in the chat, but if I've missed any, please feel free to speak up too. Yeah, I have to uh, drop, unfortunately, but uh, I appreciate you guys giving me the time to share a little bit of my perspective. I appreciate everybody else who uh, also shared their perspective and asked great questions. Thank you to uh, Rachel and our studio team to putting this together. I look forward to the future ones as well. Awesome. And Sepp, quick question. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they have other follow-up questions? Uh, Google me, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, LinkedIn is perfectly fine, uh, but I'm I'm pretty much available on like whatever platform. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is probably easiest. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Seb, for for joining and sharing your insights. I know you have to run, um, but thank you all for joining as well. And same place, same time next week too, if you happen to be free. Um, we'll also put the recordings up um, on YouTube too. Uh, but thank you all. Have a great rest of the day.